destroy it. Well, that's the other part. It's not our responsibility to help them, but it is our responsibility not to hurt them. That's correct. And the other thing I don't think there's anybody else who's even interested in this property. That's a yeah. Yeah. If we only get one sealed bit, we only get one sealed bit. Yeah. I assume it's all signed. It's all for this. It's not the industrial. It's wasting the property from us. It's what it is before the concept of zoning was even thought Any other discussion from board members? Any from the public? Seeing none, please call the roll. Barrett. Yes. Kavanaugh. <coughs> Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Lines. Yes. Ulrich. Yes. Weber. Yes. Motion carried. Item number six. Resolution number 5951. Now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that management is hereby granted a variance from the procedures in resolution number 4495 adopted June 15, 1995, to obtain a market-based price determination for the Jones Street property in order to secure a favorable sale price that achieves the best value for the property. So moved. <coughs> Second. Dr. Weber, again. As you've just heard, this deals with the process we use in uh, the sale of our, some of our property, surplus property on Jones Street. Uh, the purpose is to request a variance from the property disposition process that we typically use in, as outlined in Board Resolution 4495. Uh, we are asking to do this in order to provide for the determination of a market-based value in order to sell a portion of the surplus property. Because the property is unique and its value is difficult to ascertain, Management does not consider the best interest of the district to use the property disposition procedure as outlined in that resolution. <coughs> Therefore, a variance from the procedure in resolution 4495 will allow for a market based sale determination of the property in order to obtain the best value bid for it. Once a best value bid has been obtained and evaluated, this item will be brought back uh, to the board for authorization to sell the property at the best value bid price and conditions obtained through this process. Anybody for questions, Mr. Chairman? All right. Board members, comments or discussion? Uh, I have one quick question. What What is on the property? Uh, yeah. It is not very attractive property. Stones and the undulating uh, uh, terrace property. And uh, Mr. Johansson, you might want to describe it further. The property uh, Director Barron essentially contains the old Jones Street power station with associated offices. Beyond that, it's a, it's a portion of the property that was an old coal bunker years ago for the original Jones Street station that's been filled back in with dirt. Now it's become green space. So across that green space and to other points to the south of that existing structure, we have sold easements recently to the city of Omaha. And during that process, we had to go out and do some appraisals in order to ascertain the value of the easements. We found that process to be extremely difficult as a result of just trying to get some agreement on the price of the property as it exists today. The property is also bounded on the east by the set of railroad tracks that come from Northern and it has Union Pacific on the south and then our combustion chamber and the switch to the end of So it's a very encumbered property, the way it is, making it very difficult to determine what in the future use of the Okay. Uh, now, I took a look at it. Part of it's a huge <coughs> brick structure, and the other half is like a, looks like a steel <coughs> annex or addition. What's that steel annex? Are, they, are you talking about the riverside? Um, it, when I looked at it, it looked like on the north side of the brick structure. Well, to the north, I guess, is the office side, or northwest side, if you will, know, is the old office structure where we house generating station engineering, which was a, a form of our engineering department years ago, and some of the management office was years ago, back in the 80s. Uh, the property was since abandoned its formal use back in the late 80s, and uh, since that time, we've also 
entered the property and created all the uh, asbestos from the building is essentially it's ready for sale or salvage. So it's currently vacant. That's correct. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? From you? Very properly. Yes, it is. And as potential being the last big green space along the river within the corporate limit. So it has a unique value in the future for something that you allow a lot of work to do to make it that way. We've been trying to sell these for a long time. Yeah. We've to give it to the city. We've tried to give it to the city. <laughs> the city that doesn't want it. They don't want it. If we can find a buyer, come on. Uh, and any, any comments from the public? If not, please call the roll. Barrett? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Howard? Yes. Weber? Yes. <coughs> Item number seven, resolution number 5952. Five, five, now, therefore, it is resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that the district's general counsel and the board's governance committee shall evaluate and develop overview by the board proposed revisions to the district's charter to change its election subdivisions from four to eight subdivisions. And this matter shall be scheduled for further action by the board at its April 11, 2013 meeting. So moved. Second. Director Green. Thank you. Last time, the board of directors changed the manner in which elections were held concerning the, their offices with the city. As they sit here today, was yeah, Ed and the farmer, Ed and the farmer, in 1986. Recently, the legislature has shown. Increased interest in uh, elective bodies and managing elective bodies and determining uh, their manner of election. I think that was an impetus for us then to go back and take a look at it and say, if there are those in the legislature who have <coughs> forces to have eight districts that are eight districts, then it would be better for us to <coughs> do this ourselves rather than to have someone outside dictate. Currently, the board consists of one rural north member who's in about an 81,000 person, 91,000 person district, a rural south person who's in 91,000. Subdivisions, a suburban subdivision, which is in the 91,000 district, and five directors, elected at large, from 450,000 people. <coughs> two of those cycles, let's vote for two. On one cycle, let's vote for one. And as I can tell you from personal experience, that particular seat was always vigorously conducted, requires a lot of money. Part of the purpose for doing this and part of it is that it's the same appropriate social principle uh, that caused the change in the Omaha City Council manner of election and the Douglas County Board manner of election. And that is any opportunity you can have to increase uh, minorities. or ethnic women to participate in the process and to compete for governance positions is good. We are unique because we don't spend tax dollars, we generate tax dollars. We are unique in that we do one thing. We are not a governmental unit as such. We are what's called a governmental enterprise. We are the people's public utility. But the way uh, the world has gone, the requirements 
across both state and federal in terms of how districts are created and acted upon. It's necessary at this time to, for this resolution to take a to, to commit to breaking into eight equalized districts and come back to the board at a later time with a resolution of approval with both the changes to our charter, which has to be done by us and then recommended to our review board, and uh, with what the district lines would look like. In order to accomplish this task, it has to be done this, in this year, 2013, uh, due to the fact that we have a series of elections in 2014. Some are normal ones that we come up at that time. Others are special, shorter elections, which are required by statute due to the fact that we either have a death or election of a, of a director. So if you're appointed and your seat has a six-year term and you've only gone through two years of it, you have to run from the <coughs> election cycle and then run from the regular term at a regular time. So that's why this has to, if we're doing this, that has to be accomplished in this year. So this resolution basically, basically <coughs> takes those concepts and says the board is committed to the process of equalizing the districts and having <coughs> districts of approximately 91,000 people <coughs> in the normal election cycle of, of staggered elections because we as a board, we, we think we need that and manage things we need that for continuity purposes with our financial uh, backers. That when we go back to uh, the people who loan us, since we are a capital intensive industry, when we go back to the people who loan uh, us the money to do this, uh, consistency and continuity are two of the things they look at when they talk to the board members about how does the board function. So by do, doing this ourselves, uh, we do the district a service. By doing it, we can do society a service. So uh, that's why the resolution is here. We didn't start the process, but we need to finish the process. And the resolution basically says that we're committed to the process of going through, and then we will vote finally on something. I oppose the resolution. Um, I'm from the school that is not broke, don't fix it. Um, the change in how our districts are drawn down and determined will lead to disenfranchised uh, voters and customers. Right now, the folks who live in our metropolitan district are represented by five directors. <coughs> Under the proposed change, we would now have one director. Uh, unfortunately, this type of thing historically leads to things like parochialism. The directors will assume it's just it's normal, normal behavior to start worrying about your own turf, your own neighborhood. That's not healthy. Uh, Mr. Director Green uh, made mention of comparing say, the city council years ago to change to district elections. So, uh, the city of Omaha obviously has a number of specific concerns that are unique to various parts of the city. Crime here, uh, traffic over here, you know, parks over there, what have you. It's a very, very diverse organization in the services that it provides its, uh, its citizens. OPPD, on the other hand, is pretty specific in what we provide. We provide electricity at hopefully at a reasonable rate and, 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 as, and as efficiently as possible with one specific goal and one specific task. That doesn't matter, and it's not determined what part of the district you live in, you receive the same service at the same price. Um, I, I just think we will certainly lose efficiency, and uh, this is not good. Change is not necessarily good just for the sake of change. The legislature is trying to force this down our throats. It's been sponsored by a senator who doesn't live in the Now, I can't say it's not good as it is, it's the way the laws and the race organization is established. The state does have control to do this, certainly, and I'm not denying that at all. I just feel that it is not necessary to do this. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, I plan on supporting the resolution. I do believe if the legislature 
says to go in that direction, we should take you and, and go in that direction. Um, they create you and get rid of you as well. I, I would like to say, though, I'm not new to this board, but I've been in public service for quite some time. Been through two redistricting cycles, and it's not an easy job or a quick job. My concern would be that we take our time and do it right and, and be thoughtful about it. I have several concerns, one being the continuity of the board. Uh, what I have learned very quickly is this is a very complex industry, a lot of moving parts, and it takes time to gain that experience. So there, the wisdom of a six-year term was there for a reason. Um, so I think the continuity we need to make sure is still there. I, I have an issue with people who just got elected who now I think it's important we respect the voters' wishes on that election that just took place and those people, um, how we end up doing this. Another thing I want to say, though, is in the suburban district, which is basically Sarkin, most of Sarkin County, and I know Director Orich has some of that <coughs> as well. But I represent Papillion, all of Papillion, all of La Vista, and all of Bellevue. And you know, my goal, and I know John Thompson did a great job, when he was there, when we have issues of economic development, and they deal hand in hand with their energy needs, they wanted someone to talk to and someone that understood what's going on. And it is unique, and I hate to see. I think the way it is set up works, but uh, I would hate to see that split up into several districts where no one knows who to talk to. Um, I have good relationships with those people. We plan on keep working on those and continuing those, but. That has worked very well, and I, the contiguous aspect of redistricting has to make some sense to me. So I, I'm going to vote for it and, and work on it. One thing I just want to say publicly, to be rushed into something like this, uh, I, I think the legislature will work with us on that, if we need any legislative help. Um, but I'm not even so sure we do that. I think we can do it ourselves. I think we're on the right path. but. Um, I'm going to be very cautious on how we do this and how we proceed that my constituents that I was appointed at this point, that hopefully if I can be elected to represent those people. And I think I'd be doing them an injustice if we broke our county into two main pieces where there's no voice at that point. Um, because if you break it up into two small pieces, you don't really have any voice. And that concerns me, and I think it would concern the payers of, of my district. So. I just wanted that on the record. Thank you, Director. Anybody else? I have one more thing. Um, one that there's no guarantee the legislature's going to pass this legislation. We tried this last year. It would be okay. I realize next New Year, new senators going to have it. The other thing is, as I mentioned earlier, about the about voters being disenfranchised. At least here in the city of Omaha, we call your city council office. And, and I had one occasion with you over the years. And I knew who my, who my councilman was. So it wasn't like I didn't know him and they had to tell me. I knew who my councilman was. I called up, asked to speak with that councilman. And the, and the uh, support staff there, first thing they asked me, hey, well, what's your address? It was my address. Because they wanted to know if he was in his district or not. And unfortunately, I see that happening here. Because you know, he told me, shut out. I guess I'd just like to say that I understand your Kavanaugh's position in many areas, agree, uh, or at least mean that way, but my feeling is the inevitability of this is uh, upon us. I also share Director Gay's uh, uh, determination to uh, maintain that uh, integrity of, of what we kind of have. I'd hate to have us lose any rural aspects of representation on this board, 
as, as like if you said for Bellevue Cody, if you split it into small pieces, we would certainly do that. But I think as we go forward in a deliberate and cautious way, uh, we can uh, achieve all these goals. And I think the purpose of this resolution is to uh, tell the legislature that we're, we're going to do it, and we're going to do it our way in the best interest of what we can do. And it's very clear. Um, anybody else? Dr. Weber? <coughs> I'm going to support the resolution because uh, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, but as they say in Washington, the devil's in the details. Absolutely. And uh, I think we need to be very careful over the next time period that we have to work on this that we do this smartly, uh, with great discretion and deliberation. And I think if we do that, we can come out with something that makes sense for this district and for people who are great people. Any other comments or comments? Yes. Uh, Dr. Weber's comments are widely ridiculous. We're doing this because if somebody's trying to put a hammer on us, then we're going to do it properly. And that's the goal and that's the charge that the resolution does. We're going to do this ourselves and we're going to do it the right way. And we're going to take into consideration that accommodation. I, and I, even the nay, even the vote no, is a position we would take a look at and see if there's a way to accommodate that. Because that part of it is, is as, uh, what, as we go through this. And in terms of the legislative mentality, <coughs> I'm a great expert in that, but we have two. One on one hand, one on the other <laughs> And what they tell me about the legislature. <laughs> and, and as we go through this process, uh, especially in, in your concerns, Director Gay, is having spent uh, most of my career uh, practicing law in that county, I think that after 30 years or so that I understand the thoughts and mentalities and I'm sympathetic to a lot of those. So you know, if, if the what you say is correct, uh, and there, uh, as they all, the other <coughs> caveat to that is, is you just accepted what I say is correct. Yeah, but there may be a, a more pressing <coughs> purpose than that concept. You know, we're qualify all of this, and that's it's all open. That's why we're all going to take a look at it, and uh, we're going to see what we can do to accommodate as many interests as we can as it cobbles back together. And it is, it, this is internally going to be as much politics as uh, raw politics as anyone is capable of doing. So, uh, uh, give us yeah. some hope. <laughs> that was in the details. Yeah, that the details. That's the work. So, I, I recommend that we go forward with this. It's the right thing to do. It's necessary that we do it internally and make those decisions because we understand the district and our responsibilities as directors and what the communities would want. But we also then uh, uh, <coughs> will work it out. And I think we will work it out. So. Right, any other directors have a comment? Anybody from the public? <coughs> Corbin Kent of New York 49th Street. Uh, I uh, applaud you on this resolution, and I do believe that as uh, hearings that I've attended at the uh, legislature talking about bringing uh, democracy close to the people as possible. Uh, so I applaud you doing this. I also applaud the, uh, I've been attending, as most of you know, uh, for two years now, uh, the meetings, and now most of the committee meetings, and this is the first, what I would consider, true healthy public debate that I've seen among the board, so I also applaud that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ken Winston, 4905 South 149th Street, uh, would uh, also bring, on behalf of the Nebraska Sierra Club, we would support this uh, 
and because, as was mentioned, we believe it provides more opportunities for involvement. And then, just on a personal note, I've been around the legislature for 30 years. I also served on a board in, and was on the school board in Lincoln. And uh, it's my perception that if you can decide your own fate, you're much better off doing that than handing it over to somebody else. And for the reasons that have been stated this morning, I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Anybody else? Could you uh, go to the mic, please? Do you need to make it to the mic, or is my voice projection good enough? No, it's projection. Good. We can hear you, but we need yeah, to go to the mic. Record. <laughs> yeah, record. Sorry about that. I'm going to need you down yeah. front for the filmers. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Laverne wants to get a good picture. All right. I, uh, I was here for a different issue, but I just heard this issue, and what I was saying is that I would hope y'all would take the opportunity to explore letting, opening up y'all board to sub-districts due to the fact that when there's issues that are in other districts, sometimes the continuity of the board might not get an opportunity to be receptive to all issues. Not saying that you don't want to listen, but <coughs> being uh, just back to your work continuity and being friends and being all on the same page, it doesn't give a lot of people an opportunity to express issues. Like, for instance, with the last election, I see names up here, but every time I go to that election, I don't know who on this board represents me. So then when I finally seen where the OPPD board represents, it's very fast. Right from the beginning, top of the state, all the way down to the bottom. So it's like, who would I call to voice my opinion? Because I had some information that I wanted to send to board members, but it was very hard to find any way to get something sent that would be certified, that I would know that it was received, and that I would know that the person got it and the information was read. So I'm not saying that the way y'all do it is <laughs> not good, but I just think a little breaking up, uh, reworking, and opening up would probably help better serve the community as a whole. So, thank you. All right. I'm Richard Ventry, uh, 2423 Maple Street. Thank you very much. Laverne <coughs> Train, 4728 Cass. I just have a question. Um, will it reduce the amount of uh, customers in the service area that OPPD currently covers? Well, well it won't affect anything. It'd just be a division within the boundaries. That's, that's, a, whole boundary. that's so a whole different issue. Oh, okay. You're talking about something. No, I just wanted to. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. And Professor Corbin, it's difficult to have a division among the board when you're buying wires and poles. Anybody else? Thank you, Director. 
Any comments from the board? Any from the public? Seeing none, please call the roll. Ferris. Yes. Kavanaugh. Yes. Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Mines. Yes. Howard. Yes. Weber. Yes. Motion carried. President's report. President Gates, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As uh, usual, I'll run through the operation of the district, essentially the way utility runs, talking about fuel generation, uh, T and D finance, and then customers and our event and I hope you can do. With regard to fuel, we're preparing a draft uh, request for proposals for coal supply. This is for 2014. Beginning there will probably be a four or five year contract. Well, some parts of that contract are transportation and coal, but we're proceeding to, to uh, get down the process that we briefed the board on last month. With regard to production, Nebraska City 2 surpassed 300 days of continuous operation milestone on February 20th. That's a significant milestone for a power station. We continue to plan for the Nebraska City 2 uh, outage, which will be a maintenance outage, begins on April 6th. That outage is scheduled to uh, take 23 days. At North Omaha number five, as you will recall, we had to repair the generator there. The rewind of that generator was completed on March 14th, which will allow the uh, unit to return to service at the end of this month and get ready for summer. Uh, Central maintenance electricians, it's of note, uh, surpassed six years without a lot of time, uh, day away from work injury uh, during this month, and that's uh, a significant achievement. We did complete other outages on our gas turbines, Cass County 2 and Jones Street Unit 2 has an outage since beginning on the uh, speaking units there. With regard to energy marketing, um, we had another great month for our renewable energy. We had 7.4% of our retail energy sales in February that were renewable. We recall we had a goal of 10% uh, of our energy by 2020. We're going to hit that six years early with the purchase of 200 megawatts of wind that was authorized earlier this year. Even better news, our renewable portfolio capacity factor was 49.8% in February. So pretty windy how those are in the month of February. We are, again, preparing for the outage for Nebraska City, too. That'll be a big effort for us uh, in April. With regard to Fort Calhoun, uh, the outage continues there with a focus on safety, human performance, fix the plant, corrective action program, which is our mainstays going forward. Completed a lot of work since our last uh, meeting of the board, your last meeting of the board. Uh, many, much work on the 4160 volt, that's our internal uh, voltage system, was completed. The reactor vessel upper guide structure, it's internal to the reactor, was removed to support engineering safeguards testing. We completed uh, all five of our outage engineering safeguards tests, which are major tests for the system, uh, including full operation of diesels, full running of the diesels during all potential uh, conditions, both normal operations and accident, which may occur, and those are completed. <coughs> the uh, penetrations, the, the uh, pass-throughs on the container we've talked about for many months, and uh, the presence of Teflon there, we decided to go ahead and replace those with new ones. Uh, we have received uh, penetrations, the replacement of penetrations have started to be shipped on site. We've replaced 49 of them already out of 350. Um, those are going very well and anticipate being included in the next month. Also on the internal structure project, which has been talked about a lot, is the containment beams. Uh, the operability analysis for that is approved and is ready for inspection by the NRC. If we move the NRC for that. Many of the other projects at Fort Calhoun continue. Uh, the 350 process, which is the corrective, act, corrective process run with the NRC, is, is uh, in full flight right now. We've had two large inspections on site. Uh, we've had a look at the safety culture, which uh, we got good feedback on. Looks like it's changing in a positive way. We have evidence of that. We don't have any chilling environment issues as verified by the NRC. And we're moving ahead with those inspections and support of those inspections with some large inspections coming in April, uh, which are required before our start. We'll continue those. There is a public meeting that will be held next Wednesday night from 6 to 9 at the Double Tree, where much of this will be covered in detail. And it's a Category 1 meeting, so We'll present information, and the NRC will present information, and public participation uh, will be invited uh, in that issue going forward. So we continue to drive through the safe and eventually uh, operation, preparing for operation for Fort Calhoun. And moving on to transmission distribution, the uh, men and women in that group are doing a great job 
We've got two large construction projects uh, under uh, process I want to report on. Sub-1366, which is located in southeast Sarkin County, for uh, Director Gates' uh, entrance, I'm sure, is being built to improve the reliability and address customer load in that area. Where the crews are pro progressing well in constructing that new Bellevue sub, and it also includes six miles of new transmission to the surrounding area. In addition, the sub-1398, which is in Richardson County, eight miles southwest of Humboldt, is being built, uh, rebuilt, and added to to address load growth in that area. That load growth is due to the ag demand there, and also, interestingly enough, a uh, tremendous number of oil well pumps that uh, are being put into that area. And so we, uh, we're having load growth in that area. A lot of the subgrading is complete. The crews are putting in the equipment, <coughs> and uh, we've, the crews down there have worked through incredible weather conditions uh, to continue to keep the, uh, the construction of that sub on schedule when it is. So we anticipate to uh, put that in in good shape, but it's been a tough tough spring, but they answered the call as they always do. Uh, with regard to finance, uh, the district's management and our financial advisor met with Moody's investors. They're one of the two bond rating agencies we use, s and is the other. We do this on a periodic basis to discuss our current conditions and operating conditions. They ask, obviously, a lot of questions about where we're at. It's a good meeting. We had good information for them. We did have a conference call with Standard & Poor's also to update them on our uh, current operating financial condition. They all we're interested in an update on Fort Compensation, which we gave them. We do anticipate authorization to be asked for from the board at the April board meeting on a bond issue of 2013, called AA issue of the electric bond revenue. And this will be to refinance other bonds that would be at higher interest rates. I, uh, interest rates still can tear, uh, continue to favor these refinancings. Um, and we are going to take advantage of that because it will save, uh, save our ratepayers money. We also had the annual financial statement audit that was completed by the district's external auditors, Deloitte and Touche. I'm glad to report that all the audit results were favorable. Uh, Deloitte noted that the financial statements presented were fair and in accordance with the generally accepted accounting principles. And members of the audit subcommittee were briefed on this earlier with Deloitte and the DVD management. So the results of that. A couple of interesting projects I wanted to brief on um, with regard to Offutt Air Force Base. We're working with Offutt on a variety of potential Echo 20, Eco 24-7 energy projects for implementation in 14 and 15 time frame. These are to save energy and increase efficiency in over 16 buildings on the base at an estimated total value of $9 million. We anticipate the award of those contracts in the second half of 2013. Also, on our customer call center, we've switched over. This is a big, big effort for the men and women of OPPU to do. Um, we switched over the system on March 3rd to a voice over the internet protocol, VoIP, and that will allow us to take proper rating if we need it to over 800,000 calls a year and allow us to get them to reps primarily or, or voice answering if we can do it that way. But the main construct of this whole system is to increase our efficiency but also to increase our response to customers and the ability to get them information on outages or new service or whatever they want to interface with OPD on. Congratulations to the OPD team for that. And when you switch over a large system like that, a lot of things can happen, and this was virtually seamless. So thanks to everybody for coming out. With regard to just uh, some interface with the community, we had the Heartland Walk for Warmth and a Run for Fun was held on February 23rd. Team OPPD was represented by 52 walkers and runners and five volunteers, Director McGuire. Um, Walk, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't run. And we had uh, 300 registered folks in that uh, campaign raised close to $87,000. And this is for our assistance fund for folks that need help on paying their bills. <coughs> Separate from any, obviously, late action. This is purely from uh, people who want to help. We do have a $15,000 challenge grant from the Peter Hewitt Foundation, and we're, we're working to raise another $8,000 to match that so we get another $15,000. Campaign uh, hopes to exceed the $114,000 we raised in 2012, which then will go directly into the fund that's administered the Red Cross uh, to get it to the right people. We talked before about our air conditioning management program. Our goal for 13 is to add 10,000 people to that. We had 11,500 last year. That together will be 21,500 of the devices installed. That will be a potential to shave 32.2 megawatts off our summer load. That prevents any need for new construction uh, down the pipe, which really is a, a money saver as well as just another, black, another focus area we've got. We did have 10 times during the summer of 2012 that we executed this management program. 
So we, we needed to know how customers felt about that. We got very good response rate from being satisfied on the program. Um, mostly people participated. If you look at the data for, uh, for the financial, they get a credit on the bill for doing it. About 26% they like to do it because it helps the environment. And 10% because it can delay the future costs for power plants. 81% um, said they didn't even notice when we recycled the air conditioners because we went through. And 91% indicated they were likely to continue the program. Another uh, area we're focusing on with regard to uh, efficiency and also just saving megawatts in environmental areas are energy tree saving, energy saving tree program. Uh, just four, in just four days, we had subscriptions for all 2,000 available trees that we had in our energy saving trees program. was kicked off on the March 15th, so we well attended the event. Uh, we did partner with the Arbiter <coughs> Foundation, which we always do. And it'll save about 3 million kilowatt hours, or 265,000 energy costs, and gives about 275,000 in community benefit, uh, such as stormwater runoff and <coughs> carbon sequestration. So it's, it's in addition to just uh, the normal savings you get from planting trees. Uh, the district manager, Jared Carlson, indicated for the Arbor Day Development Manager, uh, said we applaud OPD on the level of commitment to the environment. It's a wonderful collaboration, not only between the Arbor Day Foundation and OPD, but also as a gift to the community from OPD and those immediate that uh, want uh, to see it. Now, with regard to, again, about our people, our team, which is fantastic, we have 50 OPD young professionals joining about 1,000 other young professionals from across the region and attending the Omaha Young Professional Summit, which was held on February 28th at the Century Link. It was a uh, program was sponsored by the Great Omaha Chamber. The theme was emphasizing the need to get involved in the community and in your companies. They had several breakout sessions, and uh, we find that as a true growth area for the future. That's uh, the young professionals. And I'm not going to go over the age threshold to get in there. Uh, but you know, I don't know. Um, so, and we don't have an old professional. <laughs> But they, they continue to do a great job for us, and they are the future of our company. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, President Gates. Any questions from board members regarding the report? Yes, sir. Thank you. I don't, I don't have a question. I wanted to make a comment, though. Um, I think it was Richard Ventry was talking about communications and who to communicate to. I just wanted to take the opportunity to let the crowd here. Um, Deb Emerson does a great job, I think. Anything that comes to the board is then distributed to every board member. <coughs> I've been very pleased, you know, Gary, just so you know, of receiving emails and notes and everything from the public that comes through. We all get to see. So I do think there is a that good open process and it's been great. So I just wanted to bring that up. They're very pleased with your short time I've been here to, to see that happen. But just so they know, when we receive something, we all get to see it um, very promptly as well. So just put that out there. Yeah, she even tracks me down on my tractor. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> he's an iPhone on Saturday. Can't get away from that. <laughs> Can't get away from that. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, now is the opportunity for any of you that wish to address the board and comment on other items of our business. I would remind you to keep it relatively brief, and we're not going to miss any debating with you, but. Uh, we appreciate hearing your comments. We also want to remind you that you can get your brackets in the end. And I might also add before we start the director count as the doctor's one. So we'll be leaving the woman because any of you have offended it. Okay. Um, like, I wanted to reiterate uh, the comments about Deb that anytime I provide materials to the board. She always makes sure that I get uh, enough copies so that everybody gets a chance to see it. So um, I've provided a copy, and uh, I guess you won't be looking at it right at this, at this moment, but it's a two-sided document, and uh, what it does is it, uh, oh, sorry, Ken Winston, uh, 4905 South 129th Street, representing the rest of Sierra Club. Um, the two sides of the document, one side talks about poles related to wind energy, um, and I just had someone put this together, and I just got a copy of it this morning, and I know there's three more recent polls that say basically the same thing, but wind is very popular, and uh, there's also, there's an Omaha poll that the, the researcher didn't have access to, but basically wind is very popular, and, and 
So um, when I update this fault, this document, I'll, I'll have that information on too. The other thing is, on the other side, the flip side of it is, um, is a chart about uh, electric rates and the average cost of energy, and also compares wind development. And this is a comparison between Nebraska and Iowa. And uh, sometime in 2011, the average retail rate for Iowa crossed and became lower than Nebraska's. And so uh, I realized that there are, there are lots of factors involved in this, and I'm sure that, uh, that President Gates can explain to me all those factors, and many board members can. But, but I think one of the, the points that I'm trying to make this morning is that investment of wind does not necessarily mean higher rates, and in fact, the evidence would, would indicate the major investment. And the, the lower chart shows investments in wind by Iowa and Nebraska. Um, and Nebraska's down at the bottom, Iowa's at the top, uh, between 2002 and 2010. And so the fact that Iowa has invested heavily in wind and their rates are lower than ours at the present time, uh, we think ought to be seriously investigated. And then last Friday, or I guess it was March 1st, uh, Ron Bins, who is a former chairman of the Colorado Public Utilities Commission, testified before the Nebraska legislature that when he was, uh, their investments in wind had caused uh, their electric rates to go down. So we think that it ought to be investigated in full detail. Uh, we also believe that we ought to be able to beat Colorado and Iowa at this game because of the fact that we don't have investors that have to make money on, on our investments, and also we have a better quality resource. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some opportunities that are out there in the Nebraska legislature. And I believe that uh, you the Nebraska people... You see how many people are behind you? Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm going to talk as fast as I can. But, uh, uh, I believe that, that the Nebraska legislature cares a great deal about what the public power districts think. And I believe that Director Mines and Director Gate can support that. LB-104 is pending in the legislature would make wind projects economically viable by giving them the same tax advantage fuel, uh, fossil fuel projects. If, LB, if LPBD were to support LB-104, you'd be joining the State Chamber of Commerce, farm organizations, and conservation. If LB-104 passes, you can make wind projects more economically viable, you can pass on the lower rates to your customers while creating jobs and economic opportunities in the rural Nebraska. LB-402 would change the community-based energy development, seabed framework, so it would be more viable for Nebraska businesses and communities to invest in renewable energy projects. The committee amendments were a surprise to the public and appear to violate the spirit and, of the, and intent of the CBED law. We understand that uh, NPA shares and the NOPPD shares many of the concerns on this amendment. We'd be glad to work with uh, your lobbyists to get the amendment uh, removed or modified so it's consistent with the intent of CBED. I also want to talk just briefly about LB 567, OPBD. There were eight OPBD ratepayers who testified in support of LB 567. Oh, yeah, are any of these bills prioritized? Yes, the first two are. Okay. They're both prioritized. They're both on the floor of the legislature. The first one is Senator Lathrop's priority bill. The 402 is is uh, is a, a Natural Resources Committee priority bill. And 567, we'd just like to encourage that the OPBD to work with Senator Hart on the issues that were raised on the bill. And finally, the, the, my conclusion is that we need to, the reason I'm making a big deal about the legislation is that this may be a one-time opportunity. 2013 may be the opportunity to invest in wind. We're behind in the game right now. We need to get to make major investments. We need to make changes in policy now. So um, we strongly encourage the kinds of actions that I've suggested this morning. Thank you. There are three words that differentiate us from Iowa and the way they do things. And that is called the production tax credit. Well, and as long as that happens, Iowa is ahead of us because that money comes <coughs> from the federal government and we don't get money from the federal government to, to subsidize our wind. And I learned a long time ago that, that it's a bad idea to try to engage in a public debate with somebody who's sitting in the organization. So I won't do that. Well, I, I'm but, okay. but, I'm just, but, because that point keeps coming up and you have the chart, I, I keep on to remind everybody that we're way ahead of where we, where we thought we would be. We're doing everything we can, but we don't get the subsidies that I would get. And you have to understand that. Okay. 
But the wind project is being developed right now. Those folks are taking advantage of this as a tax credit. And all the projects are being developed right now and enactment of these tax credits would help make these projects more viable. Okay. So that that's the point that I've I'll, I'll stay, I won't do any brackets on Go ahead. Uh, right behind you. <laughs> okay, I, I just um, but I, I wanted to make sure that those points were made. So thank you very much. Thank you. We got a bad start there. We can't have all of that long for everybody here. Or we'll be here way past. I won't be that long. Ed Corbin, Ted Ocean, Mark Freddie Massey. I just <clears throat> want to, uh, I attended the committee meetings where your investment person talked about uh, uh, having a diverse portfolio for your retirement <coughs> funds. I encourage you to look at the uh, energy in the same way, in the diversity. Uh, I encourage you, since you are, you will already have met your 10% goal, to set your goals higher and shoot for 25%. I think it's doable. China's wind power production increased more than coal power production did for the first time in 2012. Uh, LA has uh, decided to go off coal. And uh, it's for the same reason that your financial advisor talked about when they said we're putting certain groups on watch. So the, the on watch would have to be as well as uh, the, how much it costs, but the environmental impact and the health costs. So I encourage you to set that goal at 25%. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shall we follow? Yes, North 35th Street. We're going to be cold for a while, uh, no change in the pattern, uh, normal to uh, slightly above normal precipitation, but not enough to break the drought. That's the next couple weeks. The other reason I'm here is because of uh, LB 567. Uh, we've been uh, talking with you folks for a couple of years now, uh, and you've explained to us fairly consistently that the legislature has your hands tied as far as considering costs of generating power. Uh, you can't consider uh, health costs, economic impact to local communities, and so forth. In my opinion, 567 is a chance to fix that and open the discussion. And yet, I heard your lobbyists, who is being paid uh, by our uh, rates, say the opposite say that we want things to stay the way we are now, we don't want 567, and to add insult to injury, he said that uh, we, uh, uh, we don't want uh, unelected boards deciding things. We want the uh, elected boards representing the people. So I just want to say, I was not being represented by your lobbyists when it came to that hearing. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Vicki Young, and uh, my address um, for the record is 2221 North 24th Street. Uh, I'm here today representing the Omaha branch of the NAACP. I am the newly elected president, and I wanted to bring before you um, the 2010 uh, cold-blooded putting habits before people report. It is a very long report, but I have pre provided for you today on the board an executive's report, a much shorter report for you to look at. Um, what I'm asking from the board is for someone to um, direct me, because I am a newly elected um, official representing the branch, um, someone who I can talk to in regards to that report. Um, it is a report that has been established by uh, the NAACP on the national level. Uh, the Indigenous Environment Network, and the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization. Um, it's a systematic study of over 375 uh, coal-fired power plants in the United States, of which, um, according to this report, the OPPD plant uh, received the F rating and also was number 17 within that report as far as uh, one of the worst producers. Um, <coughs> plants across the nation. And so, as far as me um, representing the branch, I want to meet with someone to just further, you know, have further discussions regarding this report and um, the status of that particular plant. Because within it, 
is saying because of the conditions of the plant and the emissions that are being sent out into the air and some of the health effects associated with that plant in that immediate area, um, folks are looking to close that plant. And they're looking for NAACP to bring some direction in doing that. But because I'm new, and before I take that charge, I just would like the opportunity to meet with either the representative of that area or the board president or whoever that may be um, to further that discussion. Thank very, you. Very, very good. Uh, president Gates, you uh, attend on uh, meeting with her right after the meeting and Director McGuire. You know, would that be nice? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I'll get together with you. We'll, uh, yeah, we, got, we, got your note, we got your note about, so you consider this a commitment by March 4th. Yeah? Wonderful. Uh, to get, we will meet with you, and then I think you want to meet uh, before April 12th. Whichever, yeah. whatever we want to put this Yeah, session. so we'll set up the schedule for all of us. Congratulations on being president. Being Thank president you. Thank you. Something really great. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, you'll, you'll get a lot of chances to, to, uh, to represent stuff. Wonderful. <laughs> and also, congratulations. Thank you. 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 Th
And when you meet with her, explain to her how we report that. It's what we've spent under the terms of on an open-ended contract is what we spent under the terms of contract, the overall contract, not that we just turn around and take somebody to contract with that. So it's a continuing contract. Do you have any other comments to make before? When he was running for the seat he currently occupies now on the board, Mr. Barrett used this time slot to ask some ratepayer-oriented questions, and he received, received immediate answers. Likewise, this has been done numerous times by other individuals in this time slot to receive immediate answers on items of particular interest. By what criterion are they able to receive their answers, and I'm not? See? Ms. Moore, I think you know full well that the public... You can either have our lawyer or you can have the guy who's representing... This is not an opportunity for a deposition, Ms. Moore. It's an opportunity for members of the public to comment on items of public... Uh, or of, of uh, the district business, and that's what it's for. It's not a Q&A. Now, I think that Chairman uh, Ulrich could give me some leeway on that, uh, as we have for others in the past. Uh, you were just told that uh, Mr. Hansen will provide you answers to your questions after the meeting, and with the number of people here, I think that it would be best if you just proceed. So, we appreciate that. Well, certainly, the appearance of fairness is as important as the things that you carry out, and it's simply trying to understand by what rules you operate, because it certainly doesn't seem to be consistent. Some meetings you're very happy to answer people's questions, other meetings you're not. So because I said, I wanted to Thank you for your explanation, Mr. Green. Cynthia Tiedemann, 7562 Drexel Street. I'm uh, a customer and a retired nurse. <coughs> North Omaha Station emits more than 200 pounds of mercury each year. Of the 51 coal plants located in metropolitan areas the size of Omaha and larger, North Omaha Station ranks first in mercury emissions. I was concerned to learn that OPPD has requested and received an extension so the new EPA standards for mercury emissions will not have to be met by the North Omaha plant until 2017. For the health of our community, I hope, as a public power district, you will make lower mercury emissions and the health of your customers a higher priority and not just doing what is right when it is mandated. Thank you. Thank you. I might note that we had a, a detailed briefing about our strategy going forward at our Tuesday committee meetings and uh, in, in our executive sessions, and we are an ongoing effort. <coughs> Solve these issues. Hi, I'm uh, Patricia Fuller from the Council of Lots, and I live about a mile from the American Coal Fire Power Plant. Uh, we know that emissions from coal plants spread out in a 500 mile radius, so mm -hmm. the people who are living closest to the plants obviously are going to have the most impact. So I was very pleased to hear when Mid American announced that they were going to phase out the burning of the coal in their two oldest units, Boiler 1 and 2, by 2016. <coughs> Uh, these were built in about 1950, probably the same vintage as North Omaha plants. And in, in talking to the plant manager, I said, are you going to convert these to natural gas? And he said, probably in all likelihood they would just shutter them. And uh, so this is good news for Concert Bluffs residents. It's also good news for Omaha residents, although we're still suffering the impacts from the North Omaha plant. And uh, to my knowledge, I don't think there's been any asthma studies or research done on uh, Western Council Bluffs or Southwestern Council Bluffs, but I would imagine that impact is very comparable to the increased rates of asthma that are showing up in East and Northeast Omaha. And uh, I do understand your system that you have to uh, uh, base your rates on dependability and cost without any uh, consideration of health impact. But as a nurse, I find this particularly troubling, especially when you consider coal's impact on heart disease, lung disease, lung cancer, asthma rates, premature death, and mercury poisoning. I did a, attend the hearing of uh, Senator Hart's bill 567 dubbed the true cost of coal. And I was thinking to myself, this is an opportunity for OPPD to maybe uh, start moving towards alternative energy. And I was uh, very disappointed to hear how negative uh, your representative's responses were to that. Uh, I won't tire you with the statistics that uh, 
Iowa is producing 20% of its power from wind. Mid American now is close to 35% of their power. And they are number one in uh, the nation in ownership of wind power capacity among great uh, uh, utilities. Uh, the other thing I also want to bring out is that uh, <coughs> their recent technology with their bag houses, uh, they are now reducing their mercury emissions by 99%, and their uh, sulfur dioxide emissions by 90%. They reduce their particulate matter, which is a big driver of asthma-related problems, by 99%. So, anyway, I understand the differences, but I also feel, <coughs> regardless of the technology, coal is the number one driver of uh, climate uh, disruption. So at some point in time, it will not be good to hope to continue going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, board members of the PPD. My name is Sean Johnson, and I'm giving testimony as to help me why we should get rid of Pat in North Omaha. And one of the reasons why is I've lived in uh, 5904 Kingston Drive, and I'm 54 years of age, and at a young age, I was uh, affected by lead poisoning. My father did roofing, and also my mother was a nurse. Uh, and for from extra money, my father used to run, run down milk, scrap metal for lead, and he sold it. But at that time, he didn't know the smell that we was, we was smelling was, uh, it, it affected us when we was inhaling it. And where it was, it did, um, made me sick. And at the age of two, I started shaking violently, and I was uh, diagnosed with seizures. And my parents went to a specialist, and they told me that. So, I, I was, because of this lead, it was happening. And I'm telling this story because I know for a fact that uh, exposure to lead and other toxins are affected the brain. In other words, they call brain damage and uh, other problems. My OPD, <coughs> North Organization <coughs> plant, may not emit lead a high concentrate. And I smell when my father was uh, burning this lead with a smoker. Um, but at the same time, when he did that, I had a problem with the seizure and stuff. And so therefore, um, I'm telling you my story for a reason that you know how the seizures, how uh, toxic waste can affect us in many ways. And so therefore, the high conditions of this myth, the lead and stuff like that, but slowly and continues, consistently uh, the myth. And the residents of whom all live there all their life are exposed <laughs> to this uh, um, um, waste, and it can be dangerous. We already see high asthma and cardiovascular uh, rates, uh, cardiovascular rates, and um, for North Omaha neighbors, and, at, at, and this plant only adds to this problem. So we're trying to find a better solution and a healthier way to get our power, okay? And so North Omaha coal plants lift over 250 pounds each year and the mercury makes its way to the waterway and gets into the fish, and then the consumer, us humans, eat that fish. Okay? Mercury can cause the effects on humans. Uh, you know, birth defects. And so, we should, as much as we have had, as epilepsy as, um, as lead poison has made with me. So therefore, uh, this plant, that emits over two uh, over thousand tons of sulfur dioxide and adds to the high asthma rates. My point is this: after every after everything we know about this plant and it's bad and how bad it is, how can we in good faith continue to let North Omaha pollute? North OPPD should work with its communities to develop a plan <coughs> to shut down the North Omaha station health risk is too high. We can find better ways to provide power. OPPD should invest in healthier uh, and um, healthier and higher wind and solar. We should be leading our nation, not following it behind. We know better than that. And what we're saying here is that we understand that we have the power. We know that it's kind of hard to get this kind of uh, changeover. But if we don't change over soon, 
some of the kids you will see in the, future, in the future, just like with me in the 1960s, when they were burning lead, and my father was smoking that lead and smoking <coughs> and stuff like that, having their poison at the age of two. So it caused me to have serious problems as with epilepsy. You know, and, it, and this um, thing here, with this coal plant, it can cause brain deficiency and brain damage. You may not see it right now, but eventually it will come out and the people will have to deal with this problem. Because the problem here is that when you deal with toxins like lead and with um, coal, they do eventually overbid, or a period of time will uh, eventually um, uh, cause brain damage. And we uh, you know that they cause health problems, cardiovascular and asthma and stuff like that. But it also causes brain damage to kids that smell that stuff. And also the newborn babies that are not born parents or working in those plants or around those plants. By inhaling that, eventually, it will cause problems. Thank you for hearing me. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Dr. Bobby Davis, uh, 4947 Spalding Street here in Omaha. I'm a native Omahaan, a longtime rate player, player uh, for uh, OPPD, and, and I'm associated with many organizations of which all of which I would not take time to, to list. Uh, I have from here for you a physician's report of social responsibility and analysis of code, which I will give to your secretary and not take your time to read. You can, you can read. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that your problem that you mentioned about the uh, tax pro thing. I, you, you've got uh, about a thousand years of education uh, on your staff and on this board. And I am confident that you can have a way that you can figure how you can work with whatever that law is and what we need to do with, with the code. You know what the situation is, so we don't need to repeat that. We need to get over the barrier that you have that will help us to find a way to use some of the other ways of generating uh, electricity in, in uh, open BD. Thank you very much. Thank you. Graham Christensen, President of Burt County Wind Energy. Um, actual address is in the OPPD area, 5653, South 186th Avenue. Um, thank you, President Gates, Chairman Miller, uh, and the rest of the board for having me. Uh, this is my second trip here. I'm mainly here just to give a quick update on where the project is. Um, we've had some kind of breaking things going on uh, that, that I wanted to be able to share with you folks. Um, and I also wanted to say, you know, the good news to a lot of what we've heard today is that there are opportunities right here at our hands to be able to implement more renewable energy technologies to be able to make some things happen in the future. Um, and before I, I, I briefly go through a couple of the things that happened, I just wanted to quickly address your production tax credit issue. In 2007, uh, Farmers Union, who is who I'm actually employed with, uh, led efforts along with a, a large coalition of groups including our public power districts, to create the CEDA law, which actually opened up a, a public-private partnership so we can access the production tax credits. And my project, you know, looking at that, would be definitely reliant on, on an equity partner, uh, a large private sector company that can come in and be able to have the tax appetite that our 22 farmers that make up this project don't have. And so um, there are ways to be able to utilize it and move forward, I, I think, in a quick manner while, while things are as cheap as they are right now. And that's one of the points, that, you know, I just wanted to make. Uh, I heard somebody else say 2013, you know, I, I don't know that we're going to get a production tax credit again. My thought process is we're looking at rate stabilization. We want to implement as much wind energy right now as possible and then start looking at some other scenarios down the road. Uh, you see other renewables like solar dropping, you know, uh, there's natural gas opportunities for pairing even and stuff like that. But, but right now, implementation of wind to stabilize long-term rates as a hedge to rising carbon costs. Uh, transportation cost with coal and those things is, is very crucial um, at this point. And, and I definitely encourage you folks to look at, you know, uh, trying to do a bunch of this moving forward as quick as possible. So I, I do feel a sense of urgency, even on our project, to be able to try to take advantage of this tax credit that, that we really don't know if it will be around again. Um, but that being said, regarding our project, the, the biggest update that I wanted to share is we did our second round of transmission tests 
uh, including the system impact study. And the results came out exactly how we had hoped that they, they would have. Uh, what, what these studies showed us is that there was, there was no reliability issues being caused by, uh, by our turbines on our, our local transmission lines. It doesn't matter what time of year it is, um, peak, off-peak, summer, winter, all megawatts towards one way, all megawatts towards the other way split up in any direction. Uh, things, were, things were cleared. Uh, also, um, the southwest power pool lines, uh, there's no interference uh, on, onto those lines, so there's not going to need to be further transmission tests. So, so uh, we're now uh, seriously looking at, at partners to be able to, to uh, work with to make our project a, a reality. Um, just one hour right up the road um, is, is one of the reasons that we are you know, expressing interest still in, in having increased dialogue uh, in a number of different fronts with OPPD um, and, and other entities that we're working with in the public power world. Uh, we're starting to explore avoided cost rates and see how uh, that fits into some of our numbers. Um, so, so there's those opportunities, but I also think that a very intriguing opportunity in Omaha would be this uh, other mechanism that Nebraska Public Power District has been working on is, is some form of this green rate. Uh, you may be aware of Beckton Dickinson is, is, a, is a company, a global company, that is pursuing some of these opportunities. Um, they want to know how uh, their, their customer base is saying, hey, we want a certain amount of you guys, renewable energy, green energy. There's probably some, some places in Omaha that are like that. I don't have connections with those folks, but I'm definitely interested if there is. I think a small project like ours uh, makes a lot of sense and able to, uh, to help some of these kind of businesses keep costs down and show you know, their customers that they are green is maybe some kind of marketing technique. Um, I'm not going to take a lot more time, and you know, I look forward to talking to folks in the future, but uh, I just thank you for your time. Um, I'm excited because I think there's a lot of pretty cool remedies uh, in the future here for some of these problems that, that I've heard here before I got up. And, and um, thank you and wish all the best. You do know our czar uh, win back there at the right? Yes, I, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've talked to the Renewable Energy Department uh, sure. a, a few, okay. a few times in the past. Line of communication and, the and we do have that line of communication. And, and um, I'm actually going to be reaching out to uh, Vice President uh, Burke as well because um, I, I know he's had some interest in some of these marketing opportunities too. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Next. <laughs> well, uh, good morning, uh, President uh, and distinguished board members. I am Barney Muhammad from 12 Corby Street. Um, I'm just here to uh, further uh, share with you that we're working hard to get the awareness in the community of the emissions of the coal. And as you can see, um, that more and more people are getting more concerned. Um, we also have an addition, 130. Uh, OPPD customers who, off of my last testimony, uh, responded um, in terms of concerns and community health issues. So um, we can only hope that uh, the board is, is hearing what the people are saying. And I know uh, what I learned since the last time I was here, and when I went to open up my OPPD bill, that I seen the Arbor Foundation and the Green Trees and the Trees effort. So I want to commend you because that let me know that you are already aware of what's going on in North Omaha and the problems. So we want you to know that, I don't want you to know that I'm aware of that, and I congratulate you all for that. And what we're asking is to take two or three more steps um, to help us uh, deal with this issue and the health issues, because we will continue to make the awareness in North Omaha and to be a part of this process to help this overall picture and make it better. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Oh, and I do have copies of the letters for each one of you. I already have made the copies myself. So. Oh, oh. Um, so do that. <laughs> Once again, Rich Ventry, uh, 2423 Maple. Uh, as Mr. Muhammad has already stated, I'm part of a group that is definitely in the community that is spreading the word about the effects of coal and the effects of, that are happening in our community. I started coaching track when I got out of high school and got out of college in 92. Uh, we used to just have one or two athletes that had asthma. I went back to Star Coach. I ended in 2001. I went back in 2010 to coach at the exact same place, North Omaha Boys Club, and we had two boxes of asthma inhalers. So we had, I don't really know what the percentage is, but I know I couldn't carry them all in my pocket any longer. 
I couldn't have a match. So what I'm saying is that the progression of asthma and the effects in our community are happening at a greater rate. So waiting until 2017 to go back and look at something that's gonna that's almost basically not creating a solution. And so all I'm gonna do is just try to come together along with any group, uh, the board, any other members, to create a holistic solution so that everyone can benefit. We don't want the coal uh, plant to shut down or nobody to have a job or anything like that, but we do want healthy children. And when I said earlier that I could not reach anyone, what I was saying is that every address I looked up was not in the affected area. So I'm thinking when y'all go back to your subdivision, things like that, you might have a better or more decisive talk on the issue if you have a representative that is actually in the area that is being affected. I'm not saying it can't be one of y'all, but I don't think any of y'all live that close to the North Plant in the area that's affected. So that's all I'm saying as a parent, a coach, and a concerned citizen. We just want to come together not on an economic or no ethnic or no um, any other issue but health. And I know. Yeah. And Go ahead. Thank you for putting this out. I think before we have, you know, one elected representative for you, what we can take advantage of right now is the idea of our stakeholder process that we're putting into gear. And I think that we have a definite focus group here in North Omaha around the coal plant that I think we definitely have a stakeholder process here that we need to develop and uh, start with some work with this to get all of you together, not just me and the lazy people, to get a whole stakeholder group together that we can start dealing with this. And I hope we can do that in the next month or two, right. not, not to delay it. And I right. think I appreciate that, but I think I don't know if you two are already communicating with one another, but I hope you can, that we can all get together and uh, talk about this. I think it's a great opportunity for one of our goals is to have a and really, that's all we're really asking right. is that we get something started, but get something moving to provide the solution. Yes. Because no one wants to keep coming back here every year, yeah. beating the same thing, because no one doesn't want to uh, monstrosize the board as people just looking at profits and don't care about <laughs> health because they don't live in the area. We know your people who pay. The rates live in that area, so that's definitely someone you would definitely want to have the input from. So thank you very much once again. And, uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, I'm Justine Marshall. I live at 823 South 35th Avenue. And I moved to Omaha about a year ago to be in classes at UNO. And I live right by the Build Club Trail, which I love. I'm always out there riding my bike or running. And I, I always had supposed to use asthma, but I've noticed that it started to get worse since I moved here. And at first I thought it was because Omaha is so healing compared to where I came from. But by fall, I'm like, no, I should be in better shape than this. So I started talking to people on campus about it, and they're like, well, people that live east of 42nd Street have higher rates of asthma because of the coal plant. So I started reading up on that, and I noticed that it is my sports induced asthma that's getting worse, not my endurance. So I'm representing the environmental club on campus. And we are working towards <coughs> efforts to retire the North Omaha coal plant. So that's my study. Thank you. Thank you. Again, that's part of the state process. <laughs> okay. Good morning. John Atkinson, representing the Nebraska Wildlife Federation. Um, I can go on. <laughs> I like to stand. I, <laughs> um, I just want to be, be brief uh, because it's easy to say that, that we support the folks uh, who bring environmental justice <coughs> issues, we support the folks who bring health issues, and um, we just want to put in, and, and of course, as you know, very much the, the climate issues uh, are, are the, at the very top of the list. Um, it's very specifically, LB 567, that we were extremely disappointed to see um, an OPBD representative opposing that bill because we feel it's 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 very important to have all the costs um, included and we've heard from a large number of people that well we can't do it because uh, we're only mandated to 
look at reliability and, and simple costs. So we, we hope you'll change your mind on that. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Tim Renna. I'm the State Coordinator of the Brassings for Peace. And over the past two years when I've been coming to these meetings, I've had an opportunity to uh, get to meet with a, a number of you personally, and I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity that you afforded me. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to comment on the fact that we've heard a lot of really compelling testimony today. And the other thing that really struck me is how courteous it was. Is I think people, for the most part, have been just absolutely straightforward about this, but they're speaking from their heart, and there's been no effort to demonize. And that's really what I want to talk about this morning, is that I grew up in Nebraska. I'm not an OPPD rate payer. I've never lived in Omaha. Um, but every home I've lived in, every business I've been in, every school I've attended has been supplied by public power in the state. And um, I can tell you that in my lifetime, the lights have gone off maybe five times, and that was either a major storm or a squirrel. <laughs> and, um, and I don't blame you for the squirrels. Um, but here I am. And I'm, I'm approaching. Yes, I've always been convinced that they're thrown out squirrels. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they find the serial numbers off and throw the squirrels out. Is that true? Well, is that true? Well, I have to tell you, as a gardener, if you want to go after the squirrels, that would be okay with me. Um, but but what I want to what I want to concentrate on this morning is the fact that I have now been a registered voter for almost 40 years, and um, I have voted repeatedly for public power officials. I've had that opportunity. And um, for 30 years, I've been a professional organizer in the state of Nebraska. And I have actually run campaigns. And uh, in the city of Lincoln, where I live, I was at one point responsible for having a direct hand in the election of five of the seven city council people who confirm who serves on the LAS board, on the Lincoln Electric System board. And I have to tell you that in that 30 years, not once did I ever ask a candidate where they stood on the issue of coal. It never came up. I never thought about it. There I was voting for my public power officials, or voting for the mayor who was going to nominate these people, or voting for the city council people who were going to confirm <laughs> them, and not once, even though I'm a political activist with a long history, not once did I ever talk about coal. Because the lights were coming on. I, I stayed warm in the winter, I stayed cool in the summer. Public power was doing the job for me. It was only in the past two years that I finally learned that LES gets 85 to 90 percent of its energy from coal. They're of the big three in the state, they're the worst. All right. Have I ever talked with anybody in Lincoln about this? No. No. It's only been in the last two years that this is that this has come out. So what I don't want to communicate today is there is nobody in this room today who is more responsible for the situation that we are in right now than me, because I wasn't watching, or the case may be, nobody knew this stuff. We didn't really know how bad coal was in terms of health, in terms of carbon, until very, very recently. And I want to, I want to make sure that everybody understands today that there's compelling testimony and there is an appeal for, for action on this. And so forth. But from my personal perspective, none of you folks are any more responsible than I am. You have been getting a green light and a public sanction from the voters and from the ratepayers from basically the get-go of public power in Nebraska. And I want to thank you for what you've done. Every time that you guys can announce a Prairie Breeze project that will double the renewable energy that you, you provide, that will allow you to hit your goal by 2010 of having 10 per, or 2020 by having 10 percent of your energy coming from from renewable sources, from clean sources, and so forth, I exult with you. I think there's an opportunity for us if we work together to do a lot more. But I do want to thank you for what you've done. I want to thank the men and women of OPPD for what they have done, because I'll tell you. It's pretty grand when I can go flip on a switch and I've got lights. And it's pretty grand when I can say, boy, I tell you, I just can't live in this house when it's 80 degrees. I've got to turn up that air conditioner. Okay. You folks have done good work. I've had an opportunity in the past two years to find out how good-hearted very, very many of you are. And I look forward to the opportunity of working with you in a constructive fashion in the future. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, Tim. Can I ask you a question? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with Nebraska's for Peace. Is, is, in, are environmental issues a core of what you do? I thought you were more activist in other areas. And the second part of that is, 
why why here? Why not Lincoln? Aren't you aren't you based in Lincoln? Uh, so I don't know what Nebraskans for Peace your mission is. What is that? Okay, we are the oldest statewide peace and justice organization in the entire United States. Okay. All right. Lots of folks don't know that, okay? And, and we will probably die in obscurity. All right. Um, except for our bumper stickers. Except for our bumper stickers. Um, I happen to live in Lincoln, which is where the state office is, but there is an office in Omaha. All right. And we do have a statewide mission. And we do work on peace and justice issues, but what really got me galvanized on all of this is the, um, the whole issue of climate change. Because we did not understand that burning fossil fuels, which allowed us to have this marvelous civilization that we have, was actually doing all sorts of damage that we could not see, we could not taste, we could not touch. Do you also engage in uh, motor vehicle uh, changes to motor vehicle statutes because they are the largest emission? I'm, I'm just curious where you're coming from. It, everywhere. Well, what? My, my board, because you're right, we were not founded as an environmental organization. Yeah. We didn't touch this stuff. But it was about 10 years ago that we started saying, hey, wait a second. We're going to end up poisoning our home. We're going to make the, the, the world that we live in unlivable. All these other peace issues that we worry about, that we work on, become fairly moot. If you don't have a place to live, you don't have a place to work for peace and to work for justice. And so suddenly, climate change rocketed to the top of our list of issues that we're concerned about. We're still an anti-war organization. We're still working for justice for, for people of, of, of all walks of life and so forth. But climate change is now central to our mission. And, and, that's, and, and our attitude on all of this is just like your, your sign says there and so forth. I'm not into making any, any enemies here. I'm not into you know to, to showdowns or face-offs or whatever like that. I'm into partnerships. I don't think that we have much time to grapple with this project. And the best way that we're going to do this is if we all put our heads together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, Bernie Zang, 4728 KSO, Nebraska. I completely disagree with what that man said. Um, I have been testifying here since 89 and 90. We walked across the country in 1990 doing renewable energy and vegetarian diets. Um, this is not a new issue. This is an old issue for you folks. You have never pursued efficiency as a base load purchase, uh, you've always uh, added more generation every single time. Um, it's uh, been disgusting. You are a polluting utility. You make nuclear waste and you pollute North Omaha as we've heard. So, um, I think you fail. I think this management has failed. You have a nuclear power plant that's been closed down in the 0350 NRC, first time in 10 years. You told us all in 2000 it would be a $250 million dollar. This man here, he testified in 2000 and said he wanted to keep the nuclear power plant open for Blair. You spent a billion dollars since that day, a billion dollars in Blair. You think you could have maybe created more jobs than 700 in the last 10 years? I think we could have, pursuing smart grid and efficiency. That's where labor is. That's where jobs are created, when people start changing the windows, doors, and insulation. When people start really pursuing passive solar, not just active, because active is very expensive. But moving your windows around isn't. Putting in a, a triple or a quadruple four with argon gas windows gives you a times ten factor. Every kilowatt of coal we save here, we save ten at the power plant. You want to reduce pollution, reduce everybody's energy consumption. You want to lower our how much money we spend on utility bills, well, why don't you lower our consumption? You brag about low utilities, but you have a high pollution. So you have a huge impact. Now, I know we were not supposed to ask questions. I was only going to ask one question, but she told that lady we can't ask questions in the statement. Well, there's my statement. I do have a question if you'd like to answer it. Um, in the December meeting um, on the phone conversation with the NRC, a uh, commissioner asked if you were going to do any more than visual walk downs of the containment building. She asked if you were going to do any kind of penetration, any kind of uh, you know deep, deep looking inside the concrete with some new technology. Somebody said they would get back to her. I'm just wondering if anybody did, and if you have plans at all to look at the containment building for hole joints and for cracks and for other things that are inside the concrete versus just visual inspection. Why don't you meet with uh, President Gage or whoever he designates to answer that? Okay, happy to meet you. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you.